sketched out about downloading anything else on it's this all week. good it's all good so you, so you again you guys do it as a, as a group as a community effort right right so if somebody has a better computer you just need one person doing the measurements you guys can take turns okay all right, um, so thanks you guys. I'm gonna to try to get through this pretty quickly and just sort of take us home in terms of some ex other examples of restoration, but sort of illustrating some of the things we've been talking about um, over the semester. So um, start off a little bit about some of the grasslands stuff we talked briefly about. As we mentioned, um, grasslands, like so many of our ecosystems were quite different. This Bierstadt shows that in the, uh, our typical grasslands were not covered with the cloggy non-native invasive grass, grasses that now dominate our ecosystem, but that we had f all kinds of wildflowers in a typical grassland ecosystem in California, extremely diverse. We use the term grassland because we're silly and because we think cattle and things eat grass. A better term for our this community in California and for most grasslands around the world, healthy grasslands are probably forb lands. Grassland referring to the thin, plants that are grass-like, forb meaning broad-leafed. So most of these flowers you see here are coming from asters, <clears throat> uh, 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 clovers, things of that nature, not necessarily from the grass themselves, even though grass is everywhere. So it's a diverse community. Unfortunately, this is what we mostly see now. And you guys can see my screen, yeah? I'm sharing, okay? Yes. Okay. Yep. So this is, this is more typical what we see around here, Northern California, Central California, inland, coastal, whatever, right? Most of what we're seeing here is non-native. Most of this is introduced from Europe slash Asia. And we talked about the lat loss of our, of our grasslands before. Um, so we have three main types of grasslands um, in California. The grass nerds will tell you there's 24 different categories or 50 or they love to subdivide. But, but for our purposes, from a restoration perspective, a community ecology perspective. Generally speaking, we, we consider three main, actually a fourth, but, but three main types. So this would be um, an annual dominated grassland, a perennial dominated grassland, which we, which we assume is dominated by, by natives. And so bunch grasses here are what we're seeing mostly. And then uh, this category over here, which is serpentine grassland. So this is um, soil, serpentine soil, soils that are comprised of this sort of toxic mix of compounds that um, make it hard for plants to take up water and nutrients. And so in a sense, they seem like they're in a more of a desert, more of a drier climate in effect than they actually are. And so serpentine is named for the soil. There's oftentimes this, this green, this green uh, mineral that runs through it and gives it this sort of green color. And when people have, were first excavating it, it sort of curved like a snake and so that's where the term serpentine comes from. So these are um, uh, relatively highly dominated by natives. So serpentine native dominated, perennial native dominated, uh, annual exotic dominated. The fourth main type would be coastal prairie, which is sort of a, a variant of this bunch grass. Um, grass is super important. I'll just say one example of using history would be looking at our, um, our California state flag. This is a, a uh, not great representation of the flag. Grizzly bear, obviously extinct in the wild in California. 1934, the last one was killed. But check this out. To me, the more, I mean, that's an important thing, but the as interesting is this stuff on the bottom. So I first thought this was uh, bear poop when I first started looking at California. Like, you ever look at our flag? Like, why is all this stuff? Anybody know what those are supposed to be? I, I would I would ask I would wait a long time, but we're we're tight on time, so I'll just say uh, uh, small mammal burrows, ground squirrel burrows. So so ubiquitous were our grasslands um, in terms of their innervation with with small mammal burrows, ground squirrel burrows, that the early European settlers said how much they hated it. It was they had they couldn't ride their horses or their donkeys or their mules because if they would after a couple steps, the animals would put their foot into a hole and twist and break their leg or fall down or throw the rider or whatever. So when we were characterizing California, the things that when we were forming the Bear Republic and the state was just new and is it all that kind of stuff, iconic grizzly bear and representative of California, the ubiquitous grassland innervated with small mammals, which is pretty, pretty trippy that we have that ecological history written into our state flag but most of us don't, don't uh, realize that. 
Um, lots of challenges here, similar to a lot of the st stuff we've been talking about throughout the semester, lots of invaders or potentially lots of invaders. Hard note, the restoration target is, um, and a lot of the practitioners are not academics, not, not, like, not like us. Um, so lots of challenges here. I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly just because we're tight on time. Um, I established a bunch of reference sites for this experiment and you guys have seen this, but this is this idea of having no guidance initially going out and doing the monitoring ourselves, the equivalent of you going out and doing a bunch of cram across many sites to get a sense of what's going on. This is what we find. I just told you about those three types of grasses, serpentine, bunch grass, annual dominated grasslands. And what we see here, if we talk about proportion of native cover, um, serpentine are the best, bunch grasses are the next best, annuals are almost all, there's virtually no natives uh, to speak of in most annual dominated grasslands. In this case, I used these different categories to create different levels of, or, or estimate different levels of functioning and to help us with what we might want to um, get to in the short term. So maybe in the short term, we shouldn't expect to get up to the green, but maybe in the short term, we can get into the yellow and then maybe to this and then maybe to this later. I'd also note that like many things we're talking about, it's important to have specific restoration targets because simply saying we want all natives is wonderful in theory, but it's just so far from reality, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a fool's errand. So our best of our best grasslands that I used to monitor, um, you know, it's not even 70% dominated by natives. So this, this is still good, right? But, but we have to make sure we're realistic here. And if we set our restoration targets as 90% or more dominated uh, by natives, um, we're almost assuredly gonna fail. And there's, there's, there's very little chance that we're gonna get to that any, anytime soon. Um, okay, and then I did a bunch of experiments and some of my experiments did better than others. Uh, I have historically have taken an experimental approach to restoration and that's worked very well. So when we don't know what to do, we try option A and option B, as you saw with my experiments in um, Emma Goolagoon, right? With the pot, the pot experiment and the pilot restoration experiment, right? If we don't know, let's take a subset of our site and try option one, option two, assuming we have the luxury of time, assuming we have the luxury of funding for more than just one season or one, one brief cycle, we can do that. We could try version A, version B and see which one works, works best. The one that works best, That's okay, it. now we're gonna do, you know, try version B1 and B2 and sort of further tune. So even though we might not know how to perfectly restore the site when we start, if we use this phased approach to restoration, over time, we can ad adapt and adjust and use this adaptive management approach to figure out uh, how to restore the site in a more successful manner. And so for example, you see right here, I had a couple different experiments, um, seeding experiment, a cost efficacy experiment, and a tarping experiment. And in each of them, there's, there's um, whatever I did, there's some things that worked better than others, right, in each of these, but there's one that worked really well. So that seems to be the one we should be trying. And then we can tweak that and then go forward. So even if we're walking into a situation where we don't have a lot of information, that doesn't have to stop us in terms of moving forward in ecological restoration, as long as we're being very explicit about our goals and we're being very purposeful in how we're approaching restoration. So again, this is my site up there. Uh, this is some initial restoration experiments, spreading out seeds. And, and normally what we do are very common if we don't do plantings as we've dis been discussing. Um, uh, you guys, for example, when you're doing your price quotes, we talked about seeds. Seeds are a, a, a pretty cost-effective approach. The challenges with seeds is simply that um, they get eaten a lot. And so what we've done here, this is in a, a upland. This is not a wetland, this is a, a grassland. So because it's not a wetland, what, we've, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take seeds, disperse them, common restoration technique, but then we're gonna come in and disperse this. This is not hay. This is sterile rice straw. What does that mean? Does that mean it com comes from rice farmers in the Central Valley or wherever? Um, rice is inundated, so rice comes from wetlands. So rice comes from landscapes that are, that are surrounded by water. If we were to take hay, Okay, let me just be clear. So if I, did, if I just threw these seeds out and threw them on the, the dirt here, within a couple hours, the birds will have eaten them all before they had a chance to germinate and turn into plants or anything. So we can't just throw naked seed on the ground. So here we're 
we're doing this experiment by hand, but you can also use spreaders. You can also use a fire hose, essentially dump the seeds in a bunch of water and sort of blast them out. So here we've question. added, sorry, question? Yes, what type of seed are you throwing out there? Do you uh, so, oh, good question, sorry, this is bunch time. grass seed. This is uh, 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 nacella pulchra or stipa pulchra, we now call it. Okay. So, so purple needle grass, plant. this is the white lab rat of, of grassland restorations. If you're going to add okay. in some native grassland species in California, you're going to add in purple needle grass. Okay. Purple needle grass. Purple needle grass. Okay. Is that, would that be listed under the serpentine that you're talking about? Uh, it'll be in serpentine. It'll be in, in all these sites. Yeah. It'll be in serpentine. It'll be in bunch grass. It, it is a bunch grass, but it'll, yeah, it'll be just about anywhere. Okay. In California. Okay. So, so we've come in, my assistant here is uh, uh, spreading the seed and then we come in and we cover it. Again, not hay, it's sterile rice straw. Sterile meaning no weeds in it, meaning no terrestrial weeds. I guarantee there's weeds in here that are um, uh, uh, from wetlands. But because we're putting this on the grassland where it's nice and dry, if it starts to rain and some of these wetland weeds germinate, they're gonna die. They're not gonna be able to live in the upland area. So I'm using effectively sterile things. If I was, if I was, if I wanted to disperse this into a wetland, that wouldn't be a good thing because this could be introducing weeds. If I wanted to use hay, right, regular hay like you'd feed your rabbits or horse or whatever, um, that was that will bring in weeds with it. So, so I'm picking a substance that's relatively cheap, organic, will break down on its own, but it's going to create a barrier between the seeds and the predators trying to eat the seeds. This is, this is too thin an application. This is just we're starting to add. You want it to be thicker than that. Uh, basically, I did a, a tarping experiment. We don't have much time to talk about this, but, but long story short, what I did was put um, tarps down. And these are the type of tarps that you have um, uh, like uh, behind baseball stops, things of that nature. And so I, here I put my camera underneath them and I've taken a picture. So you can see there is a little bit of light that comes through. It's enough if you, you could read a newspaper, but it's, it's dim, it's dim, right? It's like being under a, a really thick shade. Um, and so, so I put the seeds down, I put these tarps down and st started this in, um, God, I'm getting so old, I have to remember what I did. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I think I did this in September and then I pulled it off at Halloween. So, so it, was about, it was about a month, month and a half or so. And these are my, my uh, technicians, my friends helping me with this. So here you see, we, we've done some experiments around here, but then we have these experimental plots. We've done some, we've introduced some, uh, we've cut the weeds, we've tried to herbicide the weeds, and now we're coming in here and we're, we're planting it. But in this, these plots, we've divided these plots into fourths. We've done different treatments. Put seeds down. Pulled off the plots. When we pulled off, excuse me, pulled off the tarps. When we pulled off the tarps, this is, this is called a tarping or what people in the restoration industry now call an insulation experiment. And this is what we saw. Tons of germinated plants. Tons and tons and tons of germinated plants. However, everything was ateliated. Anybody know what ateliated means? your intro bio class. Ateliated means um, uh, uh, starved of light. And so look at all these, there's a, there's a, a germly a seedling there, seedling here, seedling here, seedling here, sell so these seeds. But they're really, this is not a, a wrong exposure in terms of my camera. They were super, super white, almost no green to them. So it's like they were growing in a cave. What happened? This increased the humidity, okay? So this is a coastal grassland. So we have fog and things, even though it wasn't really raining heavily yet. So this is making the, uh, making the ground a bit warmer, making the ground a bit wetter. Our annual grasses, our weeds, oh my God, they're, they're thinking, this, it's, it's getting to be springtime, right? It's rain, I'm gonna draw, the annual dominated grasslands the biomass, the evolutionary strategy is to germinate really fast, grow really fast, set your seeds and overwhelm your competitors with propagules. That, that's the ecological approach, the evolutionary approach that these um, communities have been so successful at. Our perennial grasses, our native bunch grasses, for example, very slow. They produce a fraction of the seeds a year. We have some perennial bunch grasses that have been tagged. So we know they've been alive for over 50 years now. 
when you run the models out in terms of when we see you know large native purple needle grass they could easily be 400 years old one individual and so they're much slower growing all right so they're they're slowly competing for space and doing it but they're not doing it rapidly you exploiting the natural history is what we're trying to do here so we pull off the tarp all these guys have germinated and then within um a, a, a couple days all these plants die they die of sunburn, right? Just like me, bald-headed white boy, right? So they, 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 they had too much sun, too much sun. And so they all die. So, so we've tricked the weeds into thinking it's time for them to germinate. Wetter, warmer, boom, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and beat my competitors. And then all of a sudden we rip the tarp off and they don't have the pigments to protect themselves from the strong sunlight. And they, for the most part, bake. So this is what it looked like. Um, a, a, a few, uh, a month or two later. Actually, it's more like three months later or so. But check it out. So we have different experimental plots. So this area outside, even though we put native seed down, look, it's a bunch of weeds, right? Tall, the stuff is, you know, a meter thick. Inside where we tarped, very low vegetation. And you can see this was an experimental treatment. This was an experimental treatment. This was an experimental treatment. So even not even using statistics, you can see there's a different in community. And these are dot, these are mostly the green things in here that you're seeing. These are mostly natives. So uh, if you start a small experiment like that, you can figure out approaches to do, and then you can apply that throughout the rest of the area, more confident that this is an effective way to, for example, both control weeds and encourage the establishment of natives. And that's the data just to say it works. And I'm super smart and it's super efficient. Um, and then we try doing the same thing with larger tarps. So this was great, but this was nice and nerdy. And this stuff is very expensive. So then we move to more cheap, realistic, real world substances, which are the kind of tarps that you would get um, from um, Home Depot or whatever. And we're trying to do much larger areas, like a hectare in size. So we would take tarps, lay them down. So we mowed the area, trying to control, in this case, a bunch of uh, non-native brassica, a lot of non-native mustards, in addition to other things. And so we've, we, we mowed it, we tried to knock it down, and then we tried, then we, we took this stuff, put these tarps down, and at first it didn't work, and I couldn't figure out why. And then we came up and we figured out what happened was these frats had come up, bastard Stanford kids, they came up and they stole, so we had two layers of these tarps to create the right um, level of light. They had come up in the middle of the night and they had removed all of our sandbags, pulled off one of the tarps, re-put the sandbags on. So it looked like it was all cool, but, um, and then they took their tarp and they were doing like stupid college kids things, water slides and drinking games and horrible things. So the first experiment didn't quite work right, but then when we did it correctly, it, it then worked. Um, so, so an example of how we can adapt technologies to, um, to deal with uh, these challenges that we have um, and, and, and by using rigorous standards, clear goals, very specific goals, and adapting our management as we go through time, we can get improved restoration success. Okay, next example, and then we'll end with this, is um, some of the work I've been doing in Turkey, or was doing in Turkey, haven't really been doing it for the last eight years or so, because um, things like... Uh, totalitarian regimes and stuff are now in control. Um, but uh, anyway, this is this is some experiment. This is a wetland experiment in Eastern Turkey that I want to tell you guys about. And this is not coastal. This is near the um, Georgian border, Iranian border, um, uh, sort of Eastern part, extreme Eastern part of the country of Turkey. Um, but here, uh, restoration a lot more challenging. And in some, in some senses, a lot easier. In some senses, a lot more problematic. In terms of permitting, pff, dude, do whatever I want. Ooh, American professor, man, you do what you want. Yes, good, you know? So awesome, don't have to wait around six months to get permission from this guy, don't have to wait. Um, but it's, uh, it's not a democracy, unfortunately, anymore. And um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of problems with corruption and stuff. This region of Turkey massively transformed, massively degraded. It used to historically be, um, have extensive forests, was logged by the Romans, then logged by the Ottoman Empire. And now uh, forests and woodlands are, are pretty restricted. So mostly we're talking grasslands here, grassland steppes, uh, steppe communities, high, high, high elevation grasslands, and occasional wetlands. We started working here 
my, my colleagues have been working here because this is an important area for migratory birds that migrate from uh, North Africa to Europe. It's in a really important, incredibly biodiverse area of the world that people have ignored for a long time. And so the basic reason we're doing this is we're, I was, I was in charge of the wetland parts of this is, can we restore wetlands, better wetlands, better bird habitat, more bird habitat, more bird diversity, more bird diversity, more ecotourists that would come, bird nerds and the like, to see these birds and provide a financial injection into the local community. And therefore there'd be a clear economic incentive for these um, very poor villagers, uh, Turkish villagers, Kurdish villagers, um, to, to um, uh, you know, a clear economic signal to, that there's value in conserving their, their natural ecosystem and that they would get rewarded, rewarded by um, uh, people hire them to take them on tours, rewarded by people paying to stay in their house, rewarded by selling food to visitors, that kind of stuff. So again, this is gonna be a phased approach. So this is just a quick comparison between California and Turkey. Um, it's about uh, twice the size of California-ish. Um, and whereas California goes up down, and so we were pretty much a north south when we talk about different uh, climate regimes and stuff. Turkey is really an east west uh, country. Um, all kinds of stuff. Happy to talk about this. If you guys want to ask me later, I can. Um, but uh, this this was in the middle of H one N one, the bird flu, um, and I have an interesting story about that. So we were collecting samples for uh, the CDC and some other folks. Um, uh, this is a a, a, a village. Um, nearby where we're working. These are a bunch of kids that just got out of school. Um, okay, all kinds of challenges, um, but uh, first and foremost, nobody had done any restoration before we did this in Turkey. Um, very naive conservation. They, they have essentially none or fleetingly, vanishingly small capacity to do conservation in a massively degraded ecosystem. And then to boot, um, very, uh, high degree, especially where we're working. So, so the middle of the country where the capital is Ankara and to the West is, is similar to you know, European standards and things of that nature. The capital to the East where we work is more like Stalinist Russia. Very, very poor central planning, um, uh, just uh, people doing subsistence farming in, in many cases. Um, uh, main occupation, uh, dry farming, meaning non-irrigated farming and uh, a herding herding of goats and, and cattle and the like. Uh, all kinds of stories I can tell you about this. These are, we did a lot with wolves and uh, bears and these are some wolf cubs that were brought into us. Uh, there's all kinds of poaching. This is an endangered ibex that someone had shot and had on his, um, his uh, porch. Uh, very, very poor restoration skills. So this was an effort around a university that we work with there. Um, uh, so say university, they have a biology department. There's some very well-intentioned folks there, but they, they're mostly biotech people. They don't, they don't really have really deep uh, ecological skills. They had a vet school, so they knew a lot about, about cattle and horses and things, but didn't really know much about ecology, et cetera. This was their effort to restore some of the woodlands around their university. And you can see these pine trees, they're mostly dying. So this is right in the middle of campus, very easy to get to. Uh, they couldn't even figure out how to water their plants. Um, okay, so the wetlands I was working in were um, heavily degraded. Uh, and here's, you can see one example of one of our wetland, my re wetland reference sites. And you can see here, these are all sheep uh, footprints. So there's vegetation, but everything is massively overgrazed, for example. So the sheep are walking as far into the wetlands they can and munching as much of the vegetation as they can. So if you're a bird looking to build a nest, not an ideal situation. Uh, as I mentioned, birds, bird migrations are really important. Um, and we, we broke the restoration up into different phases as we've been talking about ways to adapt our restoration, ways to learn from what we, you know, starting from knowing very little, having very little capacity, not trying to bite off too much at any one time and work through a series of experiments. So we went from, just like the pot experiment, went from a series of small scale to large scale. So the first phase was small scale, just a few meters in extent. And that was to try to exclude grazers from some wet meadows. So more kind of a grassland wetland edge and to see if we exclude grazers, do we get better response? And then we went up to experiments that were hundreds of square meters. And then oh, we're trying to go to larger hectares and that's where um, when things started to blow up and uh, literally and things like that. Um, so these were different phases. I'll leave that worry about different phases. So this is the first phase, this is on the campus of Kafkas University. 
or if we were to translate in English, we'd call it the Caucasus University. And here we see, this is our focus area. This is a, a wetland, this, this sort of square thing, this remnant wetland on the campus of the university. And so um, the university would hire this. So you can see we're in this sort of very massively grazed grass, grassy plain that when it would rain, we get little ponded wetlands all around. So we began by setting up some exclusion. So I got permission from the university president. We put in some just exclusion areas. So to keep the, so the, you know, grazers, the sheep, everything had, you know, all, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of acres of graze. We just picked a few of these things and said, hey, just don't graze these little teeny spots. And so here's, here's the experimental array, the experimental plots. Long story short, um, uh, it made a huge difference. So uh, if we talk about height of the plants, we talk about plant cover, we talk about diversity, whatever, where we um, were, uh, animals had access to and were grazing. And so for example, this plot, the, the animals were allowed to graze on, this plot, they were excluded from grazing. And you didn't, need, and so the great thing here is a lot of these folks, um, a lot of these folks are illiterate. So if I were to show them a bunch of statistics or graphs, not sure what that would mean, right? But because most of these folks um, don't know how to read, uh, and don't necessarily speak English, this was a much more powerful demonstration. So also picking our, our dimensions, our aspects of restoration that speak to the local community, that speak to the stakeholders in terms this local stakeholders understand. Not trying to bring them into our world, we're going into their world and making sure what we're doing is relevant to their communities and cultures. And so here you see after the first growing season, uh, here is outside, right? Outside my experiment, here is inside. This stuff is about a meter tall. So even the herders that d never heard the word statistics or statistical significance or ecology or natural history, they get that, wow, there's a lot of biomass in here. When we first started doing this, they said, why would you put uh, these exclosures up? That won't do anything because the, the cattle, the, the, um, the sheep, they don't graze very much. And then when they saw this, they're like, oh my God, damn, right? So that was great. So we thought this was awesome. Unfortunately, then we did, we did such a good job that the next year they started cutting into our cages because <laughs> like, this is great forage. We want our, our, our animals to eat in here, but that's another part of the story. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so then I have some estimates of things and we have to do a lot of construction ourselves and building things ourselves. Um, and there's all kinds of challenges um, and we don't necessarily have vehicles. So we have to move things around with, you know, horse and, and buggy and stuff. Um, all kinds of stories I can tell you guys, for, regale you for hours with stories, but I won't. Um, about all the different uh, craziness that went on. But here's the, here's the last bit that I wanna mention to you. So here's now we've expanded. So we've gone from little, you know, three meter by three meters to much larger plots. This is on this very large lake called Lake Kujuk um, that uh, is, uh, we've located these experiments right on the edge of the wetland. Again, the idea is we're trying to create, not, not just help restore the wetland, but in particular to recover bird functioning increase migratory waterfowl, migratory bird residence time, and do that by making more habitat that is conducive to birds nesting, okay? And so you can see what we've done is we made a horseshoe shape exclusion. So again, we have these same, the same stakes, these same uh, uh, offenses, okay? And we have this chicken wire on here, and it goes down fairly deep into the water. You can see Under here, um, is, uh, he's got waders on. In this part, it's only up to his knees, but when we get farther out, it's more up to our chests. Um, and so the idea was this was not, this part facing the main wetland, the main water body, the lake, not, not fenced at all. Fences on this edge, where am I? Fences on this edge, fences on this edge, fences on this edge. But so for, for example, goose and, and ducks and things that need a, a long runway, they can, they can do that. They can land in here or go out. We're trying to keep the horses, we're trying to keep the cattle out. Um, and then again, we had, we had different, we had the, these things displayed around, the, or arrayed around the edge and replicates and all that kind of stuff you'd like for, for experiments. Um, then we tried, uh, so we started to find some good success and we realized we needed some, some aerial cover as well. And everything here is massive. There's a village here. There's a village up here. Everything here is massively grazed. And so in this case, we realized we need to do something else. And so we got permission. This was the old highway. This is the new modern highway. This goes so that the Georgian, there's a checkpoint into the Georgia right about here. It's very, very close to the Georgian border. 
So since people aren't really using this road and they could easily use this, they could, you know, just like about a five minute detour to go around on this road. So we got permission to up to destroy the, this part of the road. So we, could, we, we, we broke off um, the terrestrial connection so we can start to have um, uh, predator free or at least freer, uh, less predators, foxes are the main ones here of birds. So we can have a much larger area for them to nest. And then we actually planted this area with trees. And the whole permit here was, can we do this? And the governor was like, yeah, sure. Like, great. And so we went and did it. So uh, in the US, it would take a couple of years of getting permits to do this hydrological changes and stuff. Um, but then uh, the reality of, of trying to do restoration in um, parts of the world that don't have strong legal protections and stuff of that nature. Um, so, uh, you know, things were going great, things were happening. And then uh, we started getting this. So the villages were coming in just like our last experiment and they saw that it was working so well. So you can see how large the vegetate, how high the vegetation is inside versus outside. They started cutting it and bringing their cattle in. So while the vegetation did well, it was being great, you know, before the season was over, it was being cut in and grazed. Um, so here is one of the guys that we were paying to be a guard. So we knew this was a problem. So we hired people, um, again, an economic incentive to the community to, to, you know, protect this area. So this guy's whole job was to hang out here, do nothing but drink tea, hang out, make sure nobody messes with the cages and people mess with the cages. So we're talking to him. This is my colleague, John. And he's saying like, what's up, dude. And the guy's saying, Oh, my back hurt. So I had to go home for a few weeks. And I was like, back hurt. You still collected pay. Well, my back hurt. Right. So, so it's, it's challenging. Um, working in these areas, but you can see that when it when the cages did work, they produce a strong response, and they we got a lot of biomass recovery, a lot better functioning in the wetland, um, and and just dramatically so. Again, don't need um, uh, didn't need uh, uh, statistics to, to show this, and we have all the statistics: the improved biomass improve diversity, but this is really the big difference, right? So everybody could see this. The governor could see it. The illiterate uh, grazer could see it. Um, everyone could see the value of this approach. Um, and so uh, I'll just say, I'll just end with this. Um, there, we've had all kinds of issues. This is some work we did, um, mostly my colleagues, not me. I just sort of along for the ride, but, but doing um, grizzly bear, what we would call a grizzly bear uh, monitoring. Um, these other issues became first uh, started getting to the fore. And so our group had to start working on dealing with um, the, the killing of bears and wolves and these large carnivores. Great work, cool stuff, helping establish national parks and stuff. But um, it's because it, we had problems with um, the wetland work. And so um, because of the lack of security, because we would make all this progress and then at, on a whim, the governor would decide, no, we're not going to pay these guys anymore. We're done with that. All of a sudden, all this work that we'd done, put years into, could be wiped out overnight. We established a wildlife recovery center where we'd bring these wolf pups and things, and we were recovering all these uh, birds and, and, and uh, carnivores and things. And then the ruling party decided it'd be really cool to start feeding them and bringing political donors and, and start taking pictures with bears and stuff. So they essentially uh, blew up our wildlife rehabilitation center. And so, so um, I'm not actively doing work in Turkey. I'd love to go back, but I'm not actively doing work in Turkey anymore. But, but these ideas are really important. And one of, the one of the things I'm most proud of from this time isn't just sort of the, the figuring out how to do restoration there, but it's that we, tr we improved the capacity. So we trained every time I went there, I, I would have a different group of Turkish students, Turkish undergrads like you guys, and they would do the monitoring with me. So they would learn how to do stuff. They would learn how, the pr principles of restoration, principles of conservation biology. And, and, and they were improving the capacity in their country to, for local folks to do that. So the last little thing I'll say in terms of restoration is when we do these projects, not only do we wanna to speak to the communities and make sure that these restoration targets that we've been talking about all semester, these diverse um, indicators are robust and that we've planned this and we've thought about that. And, but as much as possible, we want to deeply involve the communities and not have token representation, but actually, if we can, hire the folks to do it. If we can, train the folks to be the monitors. And as much as possible that we can help them get going 
and then step back and be the experts when they're when they're stuck. They can call us for a problem, but 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 have them have ownership of the project. That's where it, really where you get success, and that's where you have the longitudinal um, investment and the community seeing the value and having a healthy restored system. And once we restore it, that they will be invested in in, in protecting it and continuing to manage it well. So um, I think that's all I was going to say. Oh yeah, fantastic helpers here. This is on there. Um, but just uh, uh, great partners across all my restoration projects. Most of the great stuff that's happened has been my technicians, my colleagues. I sort of sit around and act like old professor guy, but they do all the work um, and they've gone on to some fantastic careers. I'm very proud of, of where all of my um, colleagues and friends have, have gone. And so I would encourage you guys as we're wrapping up our restoration ecology class here to think about if, if this sounds like interesting stuff, we've only really just Put our toe in the water this semester. Um, it's a little hard right now because of COVID to, you know, get deeply involved. Everybody's sort of staying home and all this and that. But once we start coming out of this, we're going to have the vaccine soon, spring, summer, all kinds of need around uh, here and wherever you might end up. I would strongly encourage you to start volunteering and seeing if you can help out on projects. Start with just doing some weeding, some simple stuff. But if this is an interesting thing, I would. I, I, I strongly believe and know for a fact that restoration is a really empowering activity. Some of the things we talk about, fisheries exploitation, da, 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 it gets like, well, I hope we can fix that. But restoration is something you can all do and it's very empowering. It's not theoretically making stuff better, it is making stuff better. Improving the vegetation, improving the plant community, improving the hydrological functioning of the site. It's a very um, empowering thing. And every year we get better and better at it and, and we can successfully restore these systems. It's hard sometimes and it costs money, but it is possible to recover these systems. And I hope that you all get the chance um, and in your careers to be engaged with at least one restoration project. I think you'll find it um, really rewarding. Okay, having said that, any questions about that last little bit about uh, some quick summary examples of restoration and sort of trying to stitch some of these ideas uh, up? Professor, how is it possible, or what fields can I get into? How is it possible to get into this field from when you graduate? I, did, I got a call yesterday from one of our graduates who's working for a firm in um, uh, Santa Barbara that wants to start uh, using our students. Um, so there's, there's no shortage of projects. I would say some examples of some, uh, we, we can talk afterwards. We can, we can talk after the semester ends. I'm happy to give you guys some suggestions of different firms that are doing projects or different uh, nonprofits that are doing projects. But Ojai Valley Land Conservancy, um, uh, uh, Land Trust of, of Ventura County Land Trust, um, uh, so many, so many of our local groups are doing great stuff and they always need help. And so I would say the first great, great toe in the water is when, you, when they're having a public planting day or a weeding day, just start volunteering. Those are things they need a lot of you know, bodies, a lot of, a lot of uh, hands. And so I'd say, go out and do a couple of those and start to see what the folks are like. There's some groups that are a-holes, but most of these folks are really great. And most of these are really competent. And most, are, most of them are doing some really good stuff, but you can see these different groups. Some are more corporate, some are more grassroots. You can see which ones are most, um, most work with the kind of your, your style and your guys' interests. And then if you start volunteering a couple of times, you say, hey, do you have any part-time stuff? And so most of most people get into restoration starting by volunteering, migrating into seasonal work. Most of the seasonal work is going to be in spring and summer. Uh, so part-time or seasonal employee. And then from that, get into it more full-time if that's, if that's of interest. But I'm more than happy to, uh, after everything's all said and done uh, in December or January, to point you guys into different places. Right now, there's not, again, because of the time of year and because of COVID, there's not much right now. There's really not anything right now. But um, soon, it'll start spinning up again. And, and love to connect you guys up with uh, some of those groups. Any other last questions about that just sort of general wrap up? OK. All right, so uh, I know we're just about over time, but I just want to talk about our, our final thing. So uh, you guys have two last things for me. One is what we're working on today, which is just your CRAM assessment. And you guys are just going to, one person from the group will upload that. That's due on Sunday. 
hopefully you guys are pretty close to being done with it right now. You maybe even might have already finished it. Um, but, uh, but by Sunday, it uh, should not take much time at all. Uh, just make sure everybody's name is on there. And then the last, last thing is for our, our final wrap up for class. And so this will be due next Friday. It's a module that's activated now. And that is to just do a wetland assessment of some wetland near you. So we've done a couple of these. We did Malibu, uh, we did Ash Avenue. We talked about, we talked about Cran, we didn't, we didn't do one at, at, Car at uh, excuse me, Cam Park, but we talked about one. The difference is you guys do not have to make a video. So in the past, you guys have done the, the written thing and then make a video, don't have to do any, any video stuff, just the writing part, right? I've reposted and uh, you have the template, but I reposted the template for you. Ideally, I'd like you, if you guys live at or near the coast, I'd like you to pick uh, a, a wetland that's on the coast. But if you guys are in Sacramento or somewhere else, you don't have to, you can just do, I don't want you going very far. So just, you can do a site, any site, any wetland site you guys can pick. Could be a super small micro thing. It could be a relatively large thing or what have you. You're just gonna do the same thing we've been doing. So uh, to close out, I'll just remind you guys that was you're working for a consulting firm and they, they get this notion that, hey, these, the state was gonna be putting out a, a bid to do a restoration of this site. And you as the low person on the totem pole in the firm, they turn to you and say, yo, uh, you go, go spend a couple hours out there in the field, look at the site, give me a quick assessment, okay? And so that's what you're gonna do. So all those things we talked about, which are just simply, where is the site? You know, is there, is there water? Is it, is it, you know, what, what's the characteristic thing look like? What do the constraints look like? What might we do? Um, so it's very straightforward. You guys have done it several times already. And, and, uh, and that's it. So uh, again, um, you're going to do it individually is the only difference. So you're not going to do this in groups. You're going to do this by yourself. So the cram thing you're finishing up, group. Cool, good. The thing that'll be due next week, a week from now, is your assessment of whichever wetland is relatively convenient and easy for you to get to. The only rule is it can't be one we've already done. So you can't do Malibu, can't do Camp Park, can't do um, uh, Ash Avenue, but any other site in California. Oh, sorry, somebody said, so Joseph said he wasn't in a group. Okay. Uh, uh, Sorry, you weren't in a group today, Joseph? Well, okay, okay, sorry. So, so um, I, I can answer you guys individual questions. So, um, uh, sorry, I thought everybody was in a group when I was, when I was checking our, our bin stuff. But um, let me talk to you afterwards if, if you guys were not in a group. Um, and grades, I, I've been trying to finish get, getting through the grades. I have a big, huge list. Um, I was hoping to get them done over Thanksgiving, but chair things got in the way. Um, so uh, this weekend, I hope to have the grades all updated. Um, uh, actually, I'll just, I guess I'll end with one last, last thing because the rumor mill is coming out and people are starting to ask me more about this. Um, um, there, there's some, okay, so, so that's it. So that's so done with restoration stuff. Thanks to you guys for a great class. Sorry, we were so weird with this pandemic and this was my first time teaching online and all the lateness and stuff I that, that's my fault I, I apologize but um thanks for sticking with us thanks for thanks for um learning at least a few things about restoration over the semester in a, in a very weird uh semester I hope you guys learned a lot um always more than happy to talk with you guys about restoration or anything you know after this class is all done period end of sentence give you guys yourself a round of applause give you guys a, um I just want to say um because we're getting these rumors and they're coming out right now and everybody's just about to disappear. Um, there are some rumors going around about what's gonna happen in spring semester. Uh, so I'm about to talk about restoration. If you guys have to get to another class or something, I know I'm going long. Um, you're free to, free to log off and, and, and go on. But um, just real quick, uh, how do I say this? There's a lot of changeover in our leadership right now. At our university, we're getting a brand new provost in a four weeks. Our president is leaving to go become in charge of Cal State Northridge. So we're getting a new president. The CSU chancellor's office, new, new chancellor. He, uh, chancellor White is leaving uh, also in about four weeks. 
we'll have a new chancellor. So, so it's really hard to get a sense of what's going on, but there's been a memo that's been leaked. And you might have, some of your friends at other schools or whatever might be talking about this. Um, so presidents at other CSUs have started announcing policies. President Beck sent out an email yesterday that said, we're looking at things. So she has not said what's happening. In the content of the memo, there's a couple things. The most important one for you guys that people have been asking me about is, it says we will delay the start of classes for the spring semester. So instead of starting on January, whatever the heck it is, 25th or whatever it is, we would start at a later time um, because of COVID, because of this huge surge of COVID that's coming across um, and, uh, and trying to just sort of push things back a little bit. That's as much detail as anyone has gotten. So the other uni university presidents have referenced a memo. It is not an official memo yet. So no one has seen it. It's unclear what version people are talking about. Unclear if we're gonna be forced to delay the start of the semester. Unclear if we're gonna, if we do delay it, unclear if it's gonna be a week or two weeks or what. Um, unclear if that means we would not have a spring break, right? The natural thing is we just start a week later and then, um, you know, uh, uh, have a one day spring break or something of that nature. Uh, nothing has been communicated. And so, um, I wish I had some clarity for you guys. I do not, um, no one does, but I just wanna, before everybody completely disappears for the, for the um, semester, uh, I would encourage you to um, uh, be checking and, and I'm, we'll, I'm sure CSUCI will post it as soon as we know, but um, I think there is a decent chance that classes will not start on January 25th. As of right now, that is the official story. So I just encourage you guys to just um, kind of keep an eye once a week or so, keep a, an eye on it. The last thing to say is um, as we spin off into the break, um, I want you guys to take a real break. I've told my capstone students this, told my other students this, um, but it, very, very serious. You guys should take a break. You guys are totally stressed out. Faculty are stressed out. I'm stressed out. St uh, staff is stressed out. Administrators stressed out. So everybody needs a break. So once we get to the end of finals week, you guys should turn stuff off. Even if you guys are in capstone, even if you have some other things going on, you need to make sure you take a break at least until New Year's, right? Um, so please do yourself a favor and your family the favor and just shut off that computer. And, and uh, if, there's a, if you guys have an emergency, or there's some crisis, you of course can reach out to me. But short of a crisis or emergency, um, you know, you guys take a break. And I really want to make sure you guys um, get some rest and relaxation over the, uh, over the Christmas period. So having, th so having said that, um, that's all I had to say. Uh, wish I had more clarity, but those are the rumors. Um, I, it'll all be great, whatever works out. But, but uh, just do know that if you have some childcare issues or something of that nature, realize there might be some, some timing um, differences as, a, as compared to what you might expect uh, next semester to roll out as potentially, potentially. Okay, so I'll have to say, I'll be quiet. And if you guys wanna uh, hang out and ask me more questions or uh, for some reason, if somebody wasn't in a group or whatever, I can deal with those, um, those questions now. Thanks you guys. Thank you.